expect he will show that actually this decision uh, gradually progressed in your brain even before you became conscious of this decision, even before you realized that this is your decision. And some of you may be familiar of the classical work of Benjamin Libé, um, the first to show that actually uh, when you make a quite a simple decision to move your finger or not to move your finger, uh, there is a tiny brain signal that can be captured by a standard EEG that actually predicts uh, your decision and actually is there even before you realize or you think that you make the decision. So this was a study that uh, kind of revolutionized and uh, changed the way neuroscientists and psychologists think about free will. And uh, Professor Haynes had the courage to go back to this issue, go deeper into the brain, and uh, revitalize this uh, study with uh, the help of uh, more advanced neuroscientific tools and ecologically more valid uh, experiments. Um, if you look at the homepage and the research directions of uh, Professor Haynes, you will see that he has several other uh, lines of research, some of, them, uh, some of them applied sciences and others, uh, other interesting topics that actually show the interdisciplinary nature of cognitive neuroscience and also the potential of this field to enter into territories that were previously restricted to philosophers and theologians. Uh, so I don't want to talk more because I'm eager to listen to your talk. So thank you again for coming here. Thank you for the German Embassy to organize, help to organize this event and for ELTA, uh, the staff who helped to organize this uh, event. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me here to a beautiful Budapest. It's my first time in Budapest, and um, every time I see a completely different part of the city, that I feel like I've been in four different places every time, and one is more beautiful than the other. So I'm very happy to be here in an academic context and uh, visit this uh, very prestigious university. So um, my background is in brain imaging. So I put people in brain scanners, and uh, try and find out what they're thinking based on their patterns of brain activity. And um, I'm gonna take you through a talk um, that uh, centers on the topic of free will. And there's been a lot of debate in the brain sciences whether neuroscience challenges free will, whether we don't have free will after all because brain science says that all our thoughts and our decisions are determined by our brain signals. And I'm gonna try and unravel this a little bit and just tell you what the core of this is, what, what is really there, what does brain science really say at the moment. So let's take a simple situation. Say you're making a decision like this one here. You've got a path to the left and a path to the right. Yeah? Uh, there's nothing constraining you if you go to the left or to the right here, apparently, so you're free to choose the left or right. Who would say that this kind of situation is a free decision? Let me just ask, who would say this is a free decision? Who would say this is not a free decision? Okay, I'd say like um, two-thirds say it's free, one-third it's not free. So people have asked questions like this, for example, to the general public. And if you ask the general public about these things, you say things like, well, when people make decisions, they always have the ability to do otherwise. So they're in a situation like this, and they're not constrained by anything. They can make up their mind one way or the other way. It's up to them. There is no predetermination of their choice. They can still change what they're going to do, what the future is going to be. And um, if you ask people, this the general population, um, then people say, yes, people always have the ability to do otherwise. So this is uh, the result of a representative um, sample we did in the US, United States, and in Singapore, with two quite different cultural backgrounds and values of individuality. And you can see, this was one of the questions we asked, is whether people believe there is free will or not. And we had a, a scale called the free will inventory, developed by colleagues uh, Nachmias and others in um, the US. And this basically gives you a scale um, that allows you to map people's beliefs in free will. And the vertical dotted line here shows you the border between where people believe in free will 
and what they don't. So if they've got very low values here, they don't believe in free will. And if they've got very high values, they do believe in free will. And what you can see here, the vast majority of people um, believe in free will, both in the US and in Singapore. And I can tell you we do this in Germany as well, with the support of the Stiftung Humboldt Universität. And it's the same picture in Germany as well. So somehow people believe in free will. They think that when you come to a crossing like this one here, that you can do otherwise. You're not constrained. You're free to make your choice between the left and the right. When I say free, I mean free in one specific sense in the sense that there are no internal constraints, because you have to distinguish between internal constraints and external constraints. An external constraint would be this. If there's a wall preventing you from taking the left path, you have to take the right path. This is an external constraint. Now, when you think about free will and freedom, you might think, about, I'm going to talk about politics. I'm not going to talk about politics, but when you're thinking about politics, then most of the time we're talking about walls like this one here that are restricting our freedom. I'm not going to talk about these walls that restrict our freedom. I'm going to talk about the internal factors that restrict our freedom. That is in these unconstrained situations. So here you definitely don't have freedom in no way whatsoever. Here you might have freedom unless there's something pushing you to go one or the other way. For example, it might be that you have one of these walls in your mind, and it's not apparent, but there is this wall, and you think it exists, and it's constraining your freedom. You've internalized this, and then this becomes an internal constraint to your behavior. You think, I can't possibly go left because this path just isn't viable. I have to take the right path. This is an internalized constraint. It's preventing you from doing one of, making one of the choices. But let's take even simpler cases where there's no internal constraint in the sense that you have preference or a strong belief that one of the possibilities is considered to be uh, negative for you, um, that you might have these walls or um, uh, disadvantages if you take one of the paths. But instead, let's consider a case where both alternatives are equally valuable, where you can obtain equal reward from both of these conditions. This is a situation that most people and the lay public, and it seems you too as well, would consider a free decision. Now, what kind of things might challenge the freedom of the situation? Well, one challenge to this would be if, at the time when you make this decision, everything is pre-computed in your brain, and there is only one possible path this decision is going to take. There's only one possibility. It's not free in that sense, but there's, if this was completely predetermined, then you might think that this is a challenge to your freedom. And what I'm going to talk about is these internal constraints to your freedom in the sense of your decision being predetermined, that you might think that you have the choice here, but actually the path that the world is going to take, the fact that you might choose right or left, is already pre-computed in your brain. So let's look into this as a scientific um, uh, 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 question. There's been a history of this, and as always um, in um, the brain sciences and psychology, we like to simplify things. We don't study complex, real-life decisions, um, but we study very simple decisions because we think that the same mechanisms are at work in the simple cases and in the complicated cases. So we get people to make very, very simple decisions, but I can tell you, in most cases, the research on the simple decisions generalizes to the complicated decisions. So we've also studied complicated decisions as well, for example, which car to buy. And in these cases, the principles seem to be the same that are governing the simple decisions that we're making. So the simplification shouldn't bother you too much. In fact, the more complicated the decision, the easier it is to predict. Now, so people have studied this and very simple decisions. And the simplest possible decision you can think of is a simple decision you take your hand and whether you're going to move it or not. Spontaneous movements. I decide to move my hand now. It's my decision to move it, and when I can move it, I decide myself. And this is called a spontaneous or self-paced movement. And already in the 1960s, Kornhuber and Deke um, found that a brain potential in the EEG, uh, a negative-going brain potential over motor cortex, um, 
And this negative going EEG potential builds up within half a second to a second before you make the simple movement. So you decide, I'm not going to move now, I'm not going to move now, now I'm going to move, and you move. And there's something building up in your brain before, you're, uh, before you actually move. And because this is so slow, half a second or a second, this is a really long time in cognitive terms, you can ask, well, how does this relate to the point in time when I make up my mind, when I decide to move? And this is what Benjamin Libet studied. His name is Libet, by the way, because um, we had his uh, grandson visiting us in Berlin, and I asked him whether it's pronounced Libet or Libet, because I always used to say Libet. And in fact, Libe, Libet is the abbreviation of his original name, Eastern European name, Libetsky. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, I thought I'd pass on this curious fact. Yeah. So he um, uh, did this experiment, very similar to Kronhuber and Deke. So he recorded EG signals from motor cortex, and he got people to flex the wrist and move their fingers, simple motor tasks. And what he wanted to know was different things. He wanted to know the brain signals. He wanted to know when you move. And for this, he recorded the extra, uh, electromyogram. So basically, he recorded uh, muscle activity. So he knew exactly when you're starting to move. And he also recorded when people made the decision to move. And he did this using a, uh, an approach that goes back to Wund, actually. I don't think he knew this, but um, goes back to Wund. And he had a little spot on the screen, and it rotated approximately every two and a half seconds. So it was a very slowly rotating dot on an oscilloscope screen. And people were supposed to memorize where the dot was when they made up their mind. And this thing gave them a marker. People are supposed to move spontaneously when they feel the urge to do so, but also to memorize where the dot is on the screen so they can then report what time they made the decision at, the conscious decision. And when you do this, you find the following curious fact. You find that um, the readiness potential occurs in these situations. So you can see it again here. So the scalp voltage is negative going up is plotted here um, on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And zero milliseconds is when you actually move. So when the EMG starts, the, the muscles start to um, elicit action potentials. And the rise of the redness potential in this case was about a half, a, half a second before they moved. There are several factors influencing this time difference here that I'm not going to go into here. And the time when they thought they're going to move, as indicated here by W, was before the movement. So we first decide to move, and then we move. But the brain signal that he recorded actually happened before people made up their mind. So this is very strange. Think about the situation where you're standing at the crossing, and you feel free to take left or right. But while you still haven't made up your mind, your brain might have already made up its mind and the brain signal is already kind of planning to put you, move you in one direction, despite the fact that subjectively you feel the decision hasn't been made yet. So what is the implication of this? Well, traditionally, we tend to think we make decisions about movements in this way. We think, first I make up my mind, then my brain controls my body to do the movement. We're going to come back to this again later. This is what's called dualism. The idea that there's this private little space in our mind, and this private little space in our mind is independent of the brain, so we can make up our mind, and as long as we don't tell anyone it's private, you can't read this out of brain activity. But what these experiments suggest is something different. They suggest that actually the brain comes first, unconscious brain signals come first, then somewhere down the line you make up your mind, but actually, this might have already all been pre-decided by your prayer brain signals. And this is exactly the question we're going to ask in the rest of the lecture, whether this is true. And when I say you make up your mind here, there's also a brain process tied to this as well. And then you move your body. So the classical idea that you are the, the, your conscious decision is the causal trigger of the um, action is challenged in this way. So there are many questions that the Libet experiment raises, and I'm not going to go into all of them here. Um, but I'm going to say what we did a couple of years later, almost 20 years later, 
we revisited this issue using a new brain imaging technique that's more sensitive and can tell you more about where things in the brain happen. And this is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. We revisited this experiment and we did a simple, similar variant, but in this case, people got to make a decision between pressing a button with their left hand and their right hand. You can see progress is made in psychology by going from one simple movement to a choice between two different movements. In fact, you can get an institute named after yourself in the Netherlands if you make these kind of experiments. The Donders Institute, yeah? It's named after someone whose idea, prime idea, was to go from one simple decision to a decision between two alternatives. Yeah, Donders. So, um, so we got people to make decisions between these two alternatives and to memorize when they made up their mind. Uh, I'm a big fan of Donders, by the way. Um, uh, so, uh, and to memorize, there was a stream of consonants presented on a screen and the stream of consonants updated every half second, and this was just our way of measuring when people made up their mind. So they might say, okay, now I see the letter Z was up the, on the screen when I made up my mind, so we know when people made up their mind. And then we put people in a brain scanner. Now, um, we use a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging, and I understand that some of you will have heard about this 20 times, and others might not have heard about this ever before. But this is basically where you put people in brain scanners, as you can see in the bottom right. So they lie on their back on a patient table. They get into this um, uh, uh, magnetic uh, uh, resonance imaging uh, uh, scanner. And this involves a strong magnetic field. It's not in any way harmful to the body if it's applied properly. Um, it's different. We do, it doesn't use any radiation. And it exploits changes in the magnetic properties of blood depending on whether it's binding oxygen or not. So basically, very simply speaking, when your neurons become active, they require oxygen, the oxygen is supplied by the blood, and the blood regulates itself um, to supply more fresh oxygenated blood to those parts of the brain where there is activity, and this is something that we measure in functional magnetic resonance imaging. So measuring a property, ultimately, the magnetization level of blood. And what we get out of this is these pretty images that you can see in the center at the bottom. And these um, color images, what they tell us, for example, here is the warm colors tell you where um, there's a high probability that this region is more active than during some baseline condition. And the cold colors tell you where there's a high probability that the area is less active than during a baseline condition. So this, uh, it's a statistical thing. It's not a, fict a picture or a photograph of the brain, as many people often think, but it's a statistical uh, map that tells you the probability of things happening or not. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about what these images mean, certainly in the general public. When we measure these brain images, we use uh, sophisticated classification techniques. I'm not going to go into detail about this either. So this is uh, something that my group is specialized on. So the idea is we take these brain images and we try and extract as much information from them as possible. And we do this by exploiting the spatial pattern of brain activity. So we look at the patterning of, for example, if you see this brain image in the center here at the bottom, we try and get at the information by saying, well, how much information is stored about some cognitive variable, for example, by an action plan? Um, by the spatial pattern of the brain response? Does it tell us something about the decision person that the person has made? And when we do this, what we find is that the patterns of brain activity are predictive of the outcome of your choice up to seven seconds in these experiments before you think you're making up your mind. So let's say you're standing at the crossing, and this is symbolic for you moving, say, your left or your right hand, and you think you're still free, you haven't quite made up your decision, and just at that moment, when you make up your mind, if you went back seven seconds before that, there's already information about how you're going to make up your mind seven seconds in the future. Now, I'd like to point out that this information that we have here is far from perfect. Um, the classification accuracy is significantly above chance, but it's only between 55 and 60 percent. Be careful. This doesn't mean that you say, if I have 10 uh, tosses of a coin, uh, I get six uh, on one side and four on the other side. This is not significant. But this is many more cases. So it's significant despite this uh, accuracy level of 55 to 60 percent. And if you tailor the classifier to match the brain activity region or the patterning of the individual subject's brain, you can increase this 
um, uh, accuracy, but you can't get much beyond 65 or 70 percent in these specific experiments. If I want to read out other decisions, I can get up to 100 percent sometimes. Uh, but in these kind of decisions, we're looking at unconscious brain activity. Um, it seems that um, uh, the information isn't so high. I'm going to come back to this issue later. So you could say, well, if the brain has already somewhat decided or biased your decision seven seconds before you think you're making up your mind, how could we possibly live if that were the case? How could that be possible? I mean, how can I drive on my bike in Berlin if it would take me seven seconds to respond to a taxi swerving into the bike lane, as happens about 10 times when I go to work? Obviously, this is not what these experiments show, because the reaction times can be even below 300 milliseconds in humans. So we can obviously react to situations very quickly, but these brain signals that I mentioned before are present in experiments where we make up our mind on our own time frame. We're not pushed to make up a decision when we have to make the decision, but uh, we, it's up to us. It's self-paced. We can make up our mind in our own time. That's when you see these predictive brain signals. Of course, you can respond much, much quicker. Now, another question is, seven seconds, that's an awful lot of time. We know if I show you a picture and I ask you, is this a male or a female, you could typically respond definitely in less than a second, even in the complicated cases. How can it be that this can build up across seven seconds? The answer is, it's not surprising that our decisions take time and that they're present and stable in the brain for long periods of time. For example, brand preferences. If I were to ask you what your brand of beer is or your brand of cigarettes or whether you prefer coffee or tea, if I were to ask you if you prefer coffee or tea, presumably the decision you're going to make today was, be, would be predictable by your choice a week ago and a year ago and possibly even 10 years ago. So it's not surprising that we can predict stable performance across long periods of time. It's just something that we're not used to. We're not used to thinking about the brain in these self-paced dimensions. We tend to think of the brain as something that's reactive. Most experiments in cognitive neuroscience are the following. I show you some stimulus, and you have to quickly respond. That's 90% of experiments in cognitive neuroscience. And these self-paced cases are only very rarely studied. So what could explain these early brain signals? And there are two main possibilities that I'm going to discuss here. One possibility is what I would call a deterministic interpretation. A deterministic interpretation is the following. And see here, there are different interpretations. So I'd say uh, research is open on this at the moment. One possibility is that the decision is fully finalized seven seconds before you think you're making up your mind. In that sense, it's like a series of dominoes. You trigger an event that happens seven seconds before you think you're making up your mind. It's like a chain of dominoes. It's a causal process. It runs through. And some point towards the end, you make up your mind. If this is a causal event chain, this is, there's nothing you can do. It's a deterministic process. And the fact in this interpretation, why we can't predict perfectly is because, for example, a brain scanner doesn't resolve the neural information at the single cell level. It doesn't measure the activity of all 86 times 10 to the power 9 cells, so 86 billion in English-American uh, uh, terminology, um, uh, um, uh, uh, neurons. It doesn't measure all these neurons, but what it measures is a very reduced version of this that is related to the oxygenation level of blood. So if we could measure the brain activity with full detail, then perhaps we could perfectly predict this in a in similar way as we can predict in this domino case. A second possibility, however, is a probabilistic possibility. It means perhaps this is just like a nudge. Yeah? Remember the Nobel Prize uh, for, for the nudge? Um, something that just changes the probability of you making a decision one or another way. Perhaps it's just something that these early brain signals are express a tendency or a bias or something like that that constrains the decision that you're going to make later to some degree. But even if we could measure the brain activity with full detail, 
we wouldn't be able to predict perfectly because it is not predictable in principle in this case. At the moment, we can't tell between these two alternatives. But I'm going to take a different angle to this. And the different angle I'm going to take to this is, can we challenge this deterministic model in a different way, other than just measuring the activity of 86 billion neurons? Well, there might be a way. So let's think about this in a different way. Let's just say, when the early brain signal starts, a process where to start is deterministic. Once it's started, it's going to run through. Now, this is called a ballistic process. A ballistic process means a process that you start and you've got no control of it once you've triggered it. For example, shooting a cannonball is a ballistic process. Once the cannonball has left the cannon, you have no way, typically, of influencing the path it's going to take. And eye movements are similar to that. Once you trigger a saccade, they're more or less left to themselves, and it's a ballistic process. Another possibility, however, is what kind of level of control do we have during these seven seconds? It somehow seems that if our brain signal, seven seconds before the decision, if you trigger this brain signal, and someone says, the bell rings, and you say, OK, the experiment is over, you're not going to go through with your decision, but you're just going to terminate the experiment, come out of the scanner, and that's it. So it seems to some level, it must be possible to interrupt this deterministic process. So to do something like this, in the analogy, you take away a domino stone out of this sequence. And the question is, even if you set up something like this in your experiment, what you need to prove is that you can't take away a domino stone. You can't stop this process halfway. And, but how can you do this experiment? And I'm going to show you a way to do this experiment that we came up with. And ultimately, this Dilbert cartoon summarizes the experiment I'm going to present you uh, quite well. So one guy says, Dilbert says I'm predictable. Am I predictable? And this little cat guy says, Gesundheit in advance. And then the guy with the funny hair says, must control sneeze, must not be predictable. And then due to the pressure builds up, he sneezes and it expands his skull. And he says, yesterday I drew a picture of what this would look like. The idea is, how can you be unpredictable? Or can we be unpredictable? Or if you think about it, in the domino stone case, if we go back here, if this were true that this is a deterministic process, once I've found the onset that this is going to happen, it should be possible to predict you're going to move a little bit later. I should be able to predict across this time. So if I then challenge you and I say, try and break down my prediction, I'm going to try and detect the onset of this uh, redness potential. But please do your best, once I've detected it, to just not go through with your movement. Try and break this chain, just similar to the Dilbert guy here, trying to break the causal chain. Now, the way we implement this is an experiment that we call the dual game. And the dual game uh, is uh, uh, kind of the idea is very simple. Let's say you're in a shootout scenario in the Wild West. And you're the guy who's standing with the back to the camera. And you've got your gun. And of course, you want to shoot the other guy before he shoots you. That's the idea. So if you shoot him, you get a point. If he shoots you, he gets a point. Very simple. Uh, yeah, You only get one point. <laughs> so now it would be quite unfair if this other guy, if your opponent, had access to your brain signals and you could see the redness potential building up in your brain a third set or half a second or even a second before you make up your mind to move. And it would be very unfair, right? You say, like, OK, you're standing there, and you're about to draw. But I can see you're going to draw in one second, so I'm going to quickly draw now. And these responsive actions are much quicker than self-planned actions. So this will be very unfair. And this is exactly what we're going to try and do. We're going to detect the readiness potential using a brain classifier. And we're going to see if we challenge people to stop their movement, if they can still stop doing this movement. And I'll explain how this works in detail here. So there's a button, and there's a light. And the task people have is to um, uh, press the button while the light is green. If they press the button with their foot, so the foot movements, because they give bigger, stronger redness potential, so these pre predictive brain signals. Um, and if you manage to depress the button while the light is green, you get a point. 
if however, so you press it and you get the light is green, you get a point. Now if you press the button, you decide to press the button, you think, oh, it's green, I'm going to quickly press the button. But actually what we did was we picked up your readiness potential and we know, oh, you're going to move in 300 milliseconds. We're doing this with EEG. I'm going to quickly turn the light red and then you lose the point if you press the button while the light is red. So it's a simple game. You decide to move. We pick up the signature of the brain signal. This is the beginning of the domino stones. And we say, OK, um, he's about to do it. Now let's turn the light red. And if this really is a causal chain of events, the domino stones are falling over one by one. There's no exit, basically. As soon as you trigger this process, there's no escape route. And um, on the other hand, if people can avoid this prediction, it would suggest that they have control over this process. And this is just, just an example of the, um, uh, of the setup. So we're recording this with EG caps and um, uh, 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 going for the topology of the redness potential. You can see that on the top right. And because I realize that this is not an entirely cognitive neuroscience um, audience, I'm going to have to somehow simplify the results of this experiment. And I'm going to explain it to you in this way. And I'm happy to show other slides about the details of this in the discussion if you're interested. Now, when you look at the redness potential, there are three different stages. And there is a first stage where your decision is revertible. So that's this blue stage here. The colors aren't coming out very well. But um, the first stage is revertible. So the red vertical line that you can, can't really see. So the red vertical line is around here. The red vertical line shows you the onset of the redness potential. This is when the whole domino stone thing starts, gets kicked off. In the first stage of this process, you can still change your mind. So when the light turns red in this period here, you can simply stop. You don't move. If the stop signal, the red turning red of the light, comes too late, it comes within 200 milliseconds of your movement, so at this late stage, you can't change your mind anymore. Something is triggered where there's no way back. You've reached a point of no return. There's no way of reverting this signal. So you start preparing your movement. There's a stage where you can still change your mind. Then you reach a point. You've gotten so far with your preparation, that you just, there's just no way you can come back. If something comes, it's just too late, and you just, you're still going to go through with your movement. And there's a third stage here just for, um, uh, 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 to be complete. Um, this is the manifest stage where you can actually observe the movement openly. And this is a stage that is like a few hundred milliseconds while you can still control your readiness potential. So what this suggests is that when you make a decision, such as, for example, um, these free choices I told you about earlier on that Libet has studied, you're triggering a process that under normal circumstances would just run through where you can predict the decision. But if you get people to break this causal link, then they can actually do so. It means that they do actually have control over this process until a very late stage, and only within the last 200 milliseconds, they don't have control over this. So the limit experiment doesn't, doesn't actually support determinism. The classical idea is that the limit experiment shows something happens before your decision, a few hundred milliseconds before your decision. That means it has to have been a deterministic cause. Once that has happened, your decision was set. But actually, it turns out that you can still change this process for a long period of time. So it doesn't really have very much to do with the problem of free will. And if you were to look at a, at a graph, you could illustrate it in this way. You could say, well, I'm making this very complicated. But let's say this is the brain signals here, and this is your consciousness. You could say, well, this is my conscious intention I'm going to move, and that is realized by brain activity. And then there is a predictor here, the, the precursors in the brain of your decision, and they determine the brain. And you could say, well, this is something the Libet experiment is trying to study, how your intention here is triggered by something or caused by something that happens before. And the limit experiment, as I mentioned just now, doesn't really d nail this down because this link here just isn't deterministic. So you could say, well, that's that then. So it doesn't mean that we've proven free will. 
it just shows that the limit experiments aren't a very good way of addressing the free will problem in neuroscience. So what is a good way of addressing the, neuro the free will problem from the perspective of neuroscience? And what is the interpretation of the limit experiment data? Well, I think, actually, this is more like a personal assistant model. And um, I apologize for the, um, uh, 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 I'd say, slightly um, gender-biased uh, uh, image here. Uh, but I'd like you to think of this as the personal assistant, and this is the boss here. And he's taking notes so that he can do something sensible for his boss, that his boss wants. Yeah, she's giving him instructions what to do. Yeah. I was looking for an inverted image, and it's not available. If you have one, please send it to me. Yeah. But the idea is that a personal assistant goes around and prepares decisions for you. That's like your unconscious brain processes. But you, and the, these, this, the, the, the preparation that your personal assistant makes is predictive of your choice later on. Because in, it would be a very bad personal assistant if you always did the opposite of what your personal assistant suggests to do. Yeah, that wouldn't be a very good personal assistant. In fact, if it was perfectly predictive of the opposite, you might say that um, uh, there are political examples of where someone always, you can predict the truth from the opposite of what someone says. Yeah? So you know that when this person says something, it's guaranteed that the opposite is true. Um, but um, uh, you have to point across the Atlantic to find this role model, I think, but in, in, in its purest form. But um, otherwise, a personal assistant or assessment that is not predictive of your choice is not very good. So let's think about this. Um, in these cases, um, your personal assistant prepares a decision for you, but you can still somehow monitor it or control it until a very late stage before you put it into action. This doesn't mean that there's anything magic about this. This is just something that your brain does, but it's just not like a domino chain, but it's like lots of domino chains crisscrossing each other. So I'm just going to give a pre-final summary, and that's the little tiny extra thing uh, before we come to the end. So the choice predictive brain signals studied by us and by Libet and uh, other groups allow to predict the outcome of a decision several seconds before a person believes we make up their mind. So that's, I guess, already interesting. But these brain signals do not fully determine the person's choice. Instead, participants are able to revert or cancel their choices until a very late stage. So if anything, these limit experiments don't really speak to the problem of free will. They don't, they don't show determinism. And there are many ways in which you can challenge limit experiments, but I think this is the clearest case where you can say they're not, they don't address what they're originally designed to do or how they're typically interpreted. So what does neuroscience, what can it contribute to the problem of free will? Well, I think it comes from a different angle. I think what neuroscience does is it shows that our decisions happen in the brain. It doesn't mean that they're predicted by brain signals, but it means that your decisions are brain processes. And for this, I'm going to come to a different uh, way of thinking about the relationship, um, and that is the relationship between mind and brain. If you go back to Plato uh, or Socrates, however you want to interpret it, and, uh, or you go to Descartes, there's been there's long tradition of this idea that the mind and the brain are separable entities in the terms of René Descartes, race cogitans is the thinking stuff, that's your mind, and race extensa is the bodily extensive stuff. That's kind of the mechanics of the universe, the physics, the stuff that our body is made out of. And they're two separate entities. They can interact in the pineal gland, but they just kind of, they're largely independent. And this idea that captures, I think, why people believe in free will. People believe in free will because they think that when they make up their mind, it's nothing to do with their brain. It's something that happens in their little mind space, and this has got nothing to do with the brain. So I've, I've given talks like this for many years. And when you go to real lay audiences, and you ask the question, please make up your mind if you want to lift your left or right hand. So I invite everyone to please make up your mind to lift your left or, left or right hand. Make the decision, but don't do it. You've made up your mind, you've got an intention. Do you think it's possible to read this intention from your brain signals? A large majority of people thinks it's not possible. They think this is a little private thing in a corner of their mind, a little closet, that is secret, 
and nobody can look into this little closet of their mind. You can't access this information. But what brain science says is, this is something that happens in your brain. It's a brain process. And just to give you an idea how prevalent this belief in dualism is, the separability of mind and brain, again, the free will inventory offers a dualism scale, a way to measure what people think the independence is of the mind from the body. They ask questions like this. The human mind cannot simply be reduced to the brain. This is my scaling, by the way. Ignore, this is not the original here. Um, but, um, and if you ask questions like this, you again get these distributions. So this is now the dualism distribution, again, representative for the US and Singapore. And you can see here, the vast majority of people believes that the mind is separable from the body. This is what we have to address as brain scientists. We talk about free will. This is a much, much bigger problem. Most of the population thinks that the mind cannot be explained by the brain. Despite the fact that when you're a brain scientist, everyone comes to you and wants an explanation for everything, like the rising of the far-right AFD party in Germany. Oh, Mr. Brain Scientist, can you please explain this to me? You always want a brain scientist to explain everything. Well, I'd say, I can explain this as a psychologist because I'm a psychologist as well, and I might have some explanations, but the brain definitely doesn't offer a very good explanation, except that we're pretty sure that it happens in the brain of these voters, but we, the psychology will give you much better explanations than the brain science in that case. So people tend to think that the mind is separable from the body. We've got strong reasons to believe that's not the case. If you look at Penfield, for example, a demonstration of isomorphism between the homunculus um, and the body, the motor, and the somatosensory homunculus in motor and somatosensory cortices. Or if you look at our ability to decode people's, um, uh, people's conscious experiences from brain signals. So this is a, a video shown from, uh, from the Gallant Lab in, um, in Berkeley. And what you can see here is a clip people looked at in the scanner. And this is the reconstruction using a classifier from brain signals. It's quite clear that we're pretty well able to decode people's mental states from brain activity. So the way I tend to think about this is that the brain is the carrier or the medium in which our mind takes place. And everything we think is realized by the brain. It's encoded in brain activity. So when we make a decision, we don't lack free will because our decisions are predictable from brain signals. We lack free will in some way if our mind is realized by the brain, and the brain signals are deterministic, or mechanistic, or follow causal processes, or whatever you want to assume about this specific relationship. But that's the reason, that's the challenge to free will. It's not the prediction, it's the instantiation by brain signals. And intentions can be decoded from brain activity quite well. If you make a conscious intention to do one thing or the other, our ability to decode this is actually pretty high. So the um, challenge to free will is not because we can predict a decision from brain signals, but it's because we can show that the conscious intention is realized by brain signals and as such follows the same laws of the universe that every other thing ho fo follows, be it your brain, be it your heart, your liver, your airplanes you ride in, whatever. That's what determines um, uh, the behavior of our brain, the same laws of the universe and that's, if anything, a challenge to free will, not the limit experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gabor. So I'm the late type of guy. Uh, I'm an economist, and I do uh, uh, teach decision theory to uh, economists in microeconomics, but I'm not a psychologist. So did you say communists, or did you say most of the Economists, sorry, economists. Oh, economists. Yeah, <laughs> my, it was just my, my accent, not the... Sorry. So um, my question is a bit philosophical, a bit uh, related to economics. So the fact that you observe uh, that there are brain signals at the same time when there is mind or intention, mindful intention, to me, it's not really a proof that they are the same. It might be a correlation. So is it, is it evidence enough claiming that mind and brain are really the same, or it's just uh, something that's happening in the mind is reflected in the brain as well? 
So I've sidetracked that issue in this talk here. Uh, I, I give a different talk on the nature of consciousness, and that's when I deal with it, exactly this issue. So you can debate until the end of days on the relationship between the conscious mind and the brain, and what it means if you observe a certain tight relationship between the two. I don't think correlation is the way to think about it. I think about it more technically as a mapping, so that every time you observe a specific thought or a state of consciousness, then you observe a specific pattern of activity in the brain. Uh, this, uh, correlation is just not the right technical approach to this. Um, now, we can show that we can do this pretty well, and there hasn't been a thought that I'm aware of that hasn't been, where we haven't been able to decode it, at least to some degree. So I'd say you, you, you're not going to prove for every thought that every person has that it's going to be encoded in that pattern of brain activity. Just like I normally, when I have a lectern, I normally have a glass of water here, and I hold it up and I say, nobody's proven that the laws of thermodynamics hold in this glass of water. Because it's just, that's not how science works. Science sets up models and interpretations and laws, and then you have to then challenge these laws by showing counterexamples. So the burden would be to say, well, here's a thought, I'm thinking about a donkey or a horse, and you can't show the difference in the brain, and then you'd have to come to me and show, hey, the brain signal is exactly the same, at least within some margin of error, um, then I'd say, well, then you've got your case. Now, this is just establishing the link between the two. Um, when you want to interpret this link, you can have all interpretations. You can think that it's a pre-stabilized harmony, that these things are pre-stabilized by God to be exactly the same. You can think that they're just two sides of a medal, two different properties of the same thing. Um, you can think that they're the same thing. Um, it doesn't really matter. From the viewpoint of empirical sciences, it, all that matters is every time you have this conscious experience, you have this state in the brain. How you want to interpret the mapping between these two, the consistent mapping between these two, that's up to a philosopher. I don't think that's, that's just like asking why the gravitational constant is 9.81 or 9.0. If you go to a physicist and why is it 9.81, they're going to say, well, that's just what we observe. That's it. And you can speculate about that, but that's just not my job. And I, I think there's a, I take a pragmatic approach to consciousness, and I, I think empirical scientists are agnostic with respect to the, I'd say, metaphysical interpretation of the link between the mind and the brain. Yeah. That's why I don't, say, I li I don't like to say causes the, mind, the brain causes the mind or things like that, because I don't want to presuppose specific relationships between the two. Uh, I prefer to keep it more close to the data and then leave the interpretation as something separate to come on top of that. Yeah. Uh, what do you think in our everyday simple decisions, um, how many of them are predetermined uh, by our habits, and how many decisions do we make consciously? This is more related to psychology. I don't think that anyone can credibly give you a number or a percentage for that, because it's very hard to quantify. Um, but it's quite clear that there are many cases where we make routine decisions that don't pass through our consciousness. Um, the most intuitive example is the famous highway hypnosis which is a very bad term, but that's just a label it, it has. When you're driving a car, when you start driving a car, you're overwhelmed by all the controls you have to deal with, the steering wheel, the pedals, um, uh, the gearbox and everything. You have to deal with all these complicated controls and you're overwhelmed and you can't even get it in your head at once, it seems. It's like an overload of your working memory. Whereas when you're a proficient driver, suddenly these things seem to happen automatically, and in simple traffic situations, you can navigate and have a perfect conversation with your passenger or listen to a radio show perfectly without feeling that you're spending any mental capacity on the driving itself. So that's a routinization where um, certain tasks can become automatized to a degree that you feel that you're not actually controlling anything anymore consciously. And the, the advantage of this is it's very robust. So it's, um, but it's also very, I'd say, difficult when the conditions of this automatization change. 
So when the um, traffic situation suddenly is different than you expect it to be, for example, someone comes the opposite way on the motorway, then you start making a conscious decision. So the, um, the answer to your question is not so much a percentage, but more an example of the cases when you need to consciously think about the decision and when not. And the case where you need to consciously think about your decision is traditionally assumed to be when um, you don't have a prepackaged routine to deal with the situation, but you have to make up some new strategy for dealing with the situation. In those cases, you need to think about it consciously. Um, and of course, if you have something very dull that you're doing and you can use it, you can use routine to, to solve that, you won't be, you won't have as many decision points as when you're making very complicated, um, have a very complicated job and you've got lots of decision points on the way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question might be a bit philosophical as well. Do you think there is a difference between free will and free act? And if there is, then which ones were you measuring with your imaging techniques or methods? Because I believe that um, people have or might have free will to do whatever they want or a lot of different intentions on their mind, but what actually manifests or what they actually do might be different and that's what might be controlled or restricted by a lot of things. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's like similar to Frankfurt's ideas of um, uh, free will. And I, I definitely believe that there are different levels of this. So there's one aspect is whether your environment allows you to do something. But even if your environment allows you to do something, uh, or doesn't allow you to do something, if it's something you want to spontaneously do, the question is, are you, did, was this a free decision or not? So if you go back to this case where the wall, there's the wall, but you don't know there is a wall, and you would have chosen to go right anyway, but there's the wall blocking the left path. Was your decision to take the right path a free decision? I'd say, well, it wasn't free in the sense that it was unconstrained, that you could have chosen otherwise. But there's a different way of defining freedom in philosophy, which is that if your decision is based on your motives, your desires, your reasons, and things like that. So if you've got a reason to go right, and a motive to go right, and you go right, then this is technically, using a very technical philosophical language, this can be considered free as well. And that's, that's what I would consider um, a, an alternative route to freedom. Uh, I don't think that that is good to phrase that as freedom. I, I think it's more something that has to do with responsibility than with freedom. But people's intuitions about the term freedom can go very different ways. Yeah. My question is more practical. In a conflict, for example, before you lash out, before you go the you know, the automatic way. How can you lengthen that? I don't know how many seconds so that you can actually make a more conscious and maybe a better decision in, in the conflict itself, if you have any ideas. <laughs> well, the decisions here are self-paced decisions, so they're not really reactive to environmental demands. And um, uh, in general speaking, um, some cases you're going to need to act quickly and then fast is better. And there are other cases where you might want to think about it a bit more and it might take a little bit of time to think through the consequences of your actions and not be driven by spontaneous routines, that um, automatisms. So I'd say uh, in general this old, um, uh, uh, I'd say cliche that when you're in a situation where you want to respond violently, aggressively, whatever, it's always better to take some time to think it through and not send off that nasty email, but send off the next day and think about it again. Give yourself some time to think through the consequences because obviously what's driving you to respond in that case is not that different from a reflex, like a knee-jerk reflex. And you don't want to be someone who causes a lot of trouble in their life and other people's lives due to a knee-jerk reflex. You want to be sure that this is the best possible solution. And I think that's... so. The better advice is always to think about it. I, I, I know that's trivial, but um, uh, that's all you can do. <laughs> hello. Uh, hello. I'm Dash. Thanks for the great lecture. My question is about what do you think about the social and ethical implications of this concept of not, ha not having a free will? Well, there is a big debate. Uh, on the nature of free will and of ex existence or not. And a lot of it, I think, is a little bit misguided. So it's almost as if there is this trophy that's 
free will, and one camp claims to be able to deny it as empiricists, another camp claims to um, protect it, that's typically compatible as philosophers. So there's a field in philosophy where people believe, for example, that free will is compatible with determinism. And a lot of this debate is not very sensible because it all boils down to different ways of defining freedom. What do you consider free? And one is one way of consider, design, defining free is that you say a decision is free if at the point in time when you make the decision, there are still degrees of freedom that are not constrained by your prior brain states, for example, or by the structure of your brain, there's still leeway for you to behave in different ways, however irrational that might be. I'm not saying I support this idea, but that's one way in which people think about freedom. And another way which people think about freedom is in the sense I mentioned just now, in terms of reasons, motives, um, so that if your decision is based not on a knee-jerk reflex, but it's kind of gone through process in the preparation of your decision, your motives and your reasons have been involved, they've been causally involved in this, um, then that's what you consider free. And that's what a lot of philosophers would say, not all of them, but compatibilist philosophers would often say something similar to that. And they're just different definitions of freedom. And I think, I think that saying free will is when you decide based on reasons or motives doesn't, for me, it's not a very intuitive way of defining free will. Uh, and what most of them are after then is actually a second step, which is they want to use that to justify responsibility. There's this old idea that freedom is necessary for responsibility. It goes back in theology. Um, how can man be guilty if he, at the point of time where in the Garden of Eden, they ate the apple, they couldn't choose otherwise. It was completely automatic because humans were built in a way when they see an apple, they just, they just have to eat it, like a knee-jerk reflex. Then you say, well, come on, God, you build us in a way that we have this knee-jerk reflex, we just have to eat the apple as soon as we see it. Come on, give me some break. Don't make me guilty of this, and you don't have to kill your son for this, etc., etc. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to say, no, there has to be some sense of freedom. There was some free will when they decided to, to eat the apple. And... Um, um, so there's this notion that freedom is necessary for responsibility. And I think that part is exactly the problem. There's the empirical scientists, they say, well, this idea that when you make up your mind, you're unconstrained, um, that seems to be wrong. And the way people think they make up their mind, that they feel they have degrees of freedom they don't have, seems to be wrong. On the other hand, people want to maintain responsibility. They want you to be, somehow be able to hold you responsible. And the link between the two is that almost like a knee-jerk reflex to repeat the mantra that freedom is necessary for responsibility. I'm not sure if that is so sensible, and I'm going to explain to you why. We actually did a lot of lay summaries, uh, lay um, uh, um, questionnaires on this as well. And just think about the situation where you're standing at the street crossing. Let me see, I might even have a slide of this. And let me bring this back. I don't have that specific slide, but now let's just go back here. And you feel this is a free decision. And most people would agree this seems, this feels like a free decision. Even if you're constrained by your brain signals, you somehow feel that you have the freedom to do otherwise here. That's a, the that's a naive intuition, because most people are dualists, they feel that they're free to do otherwise. So let's take a different situation now. Let's follow the philosophical idea that if you have reasons and motives, then you're free. So let's just imagine a pot of gold on the right and nothing on the left. In this case, you've got a good reason to take the right. And according to philosophical thought in, um, on reason responsiveness, you would consider to be free if there's a pot of gold on the right and you go to the right and you take the pot of gold. But actually what turns out is that most people feel they don't have the freedom to choose otherwise in these situations where there are strong payoffs. So if there is a pot of gold on the right, people think that they're constrained, they can't take the other option. If there's a million euros on the right and nothing on the left, you don't say, oh well, I could choose this one or that one. No, you don't. You think, I have to choose the million euros. I just can't go against choosing the million euros. And you feel constrained by your reasons and motives. 
So the subject of sense of freedom is constrained by the motivation. It's not, it's not made possible by the motives, but it's actually constrained by the motives. So I think if you then ask a different question in situations similar to this one, you say, is a person responsible in a case like this? You say, yeah, I'm not sure. It was an arbitrary decision. But when you give them a pot of gold or a million euros, they say, yeah, you're responsible for this. So responsibility and freedom can actually be anti-correlated. Something that increases your freedom can actually make you judge someone as less responsible. And I think the whole framework that people have traditionally been thinking about this in seems to be wrong, because most philosophers would assume the case with the million euros is one that is more free, whereas intuitively most people would say that's the case where you're less free. And that's the link to society and responsibility. I don't think we need freedom to justify responsibility. I have uh, a measurement type of question for, uh, related to your uh, experiment testing, the, the deterministic idea. Um, so isn't there a buildup in um, response potential on the EEG when you reconsider your, your choice of pushing the button? So you have this reactive action of not pushing. So isn't there a signal related to that? Yeah, there at is. At the same time, and isn't it confounding then something in, in or? Well, it's like a chain of events. Think of it like two chains of events. One is the chain of event that's running through. It's going kind of like um, your visual system. At the beginning of an experiment, you might kind of plan to do um, the movement, repair everything into the motor cortex, and you send it down the spinal cord to kind of uh, to your muscles. Another process is the stop signal. It starts with your retina, where the red light appears. It goes all the way to prefrontal cortex, and we see stop signal related information in the brain. And then it seems from work of other researchers that if the stop signal is like a domino stone, you, you start at one chain of events, and the second one has to somehow catch up. And the catching up seems to have to occur by the level of the basal ganglia. And if you don't catch up by the level of the basal ganglia, then the process becomes ballistic. You can't control it anymore. So, of course, there is a process in terms of the stopping. It's not something you don't decide yourself to stop, but there's a red light that's telling you to stop. Um, and in these cases, uh, there is just a point of no return. And beyond that, your stop signal is not going to have any effect anymore. The fascinating thing is that in this and in other studies, these stop signals have to be there 200 milliseconds before your movement. If you think about the visual processing being 100 milliseconds, the question is, wow, why does it take so, why, why can't you intervene with this? It's, it's quite a long time before the movement when this point of no return is reached. And that's, that's, that's a mystery to me. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this inspiring talk Thanks. that uh, created even a very lively discussion. So thank you very much again for coming here, for the audience to ask questions and come here. Thank you. Thank you.